we've got this crazy, crazy situation. Um, whenever anyone has done a study of how secure the actual voting technology is, um, it's come out so ridiculously un insecure um, as to be just amazing. For example, um, my favorite early study was done by some former, well, mostly by some former national security agency people at a company called RABA. And you can Google the RABA report and you can pull down a copy of this report. It was done for Maryland um, and it showed that they could hack into every piece of voting equipment used in Maryland and completely change the outcome. But it was like, to just demonstrate like how ridiculously insecure it was, they didn't actually use their own technology to do it. These are guys you know, who spent careers in the NSA hacking into things, right? They wanted to show how easy it was, and so they just refused to use their own kit. They literally took only a credit card with them and downloaded from the internet a $450 intrusion program. And they were completely able to own the server, totally insert, change the votes in the server, and all they needed was the, the phone number of the modem. Okay. But by using a bog standard, you could buy one now for $450 on the internet, no skill required, piece of software. So it's not like, it wasn't, but as one guy said, it's not like the people at, uh, at Diebel implemented security badly. They didn't implement security at all. I mean, just ridiculous. Like everything they tried worked, right? Like the guy who was there to pick the lock could pick the lock, but everyone else could pick the lock too. Even the guys who weren't supposed to know how to pick locks. The guy who was there to pick the lock could do it, you know, from the back or something. You know, but, the, but the other people in the room who weren't even lock people could pick the lock. Could you guess the password? Yes, you could guess the password. By the way, the key that opened one voting machine could open all the voting machines that, that Diebold sells all over the country. It wasn't like, in fact, someone actually took a photograph off of Diebold's website. This wasn't done by the same team, done by a different team. Took the photograph and figured out what the grooves and the key were just from a photograph on Diebold's own website. I mean, these guys can't get out of their own way. For, for making election technology. Oh, thank you so much. Um, so this is a talk about, uh, on the one hand, how ridiculously insecure and untrustworthy elections are right now, and how it provides an unbelievably gorgeous opportunity for Occupy to have an early victory um, by, by fixing this problem. You're not actually supually supposed to use the term when you're talking about elections. Fixing elections actually has the opposite meaning. But by repairing, <laughs> repairing this problem, we can make elections much more trustworthy. Um, and so it provides an opportunity for an early victory. So if this is something you'd like to hear about, come join us. We're kind of circled up a little bit. If this is not what you want to hear about without any awkwardness, you can move on. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, which, which workshop is it? This is a workshop on early victories that Occupy can have, and in particular, um, an idea for one that involves making elections way more trustworthy than they are right now. Okay. Um, so and the, the idea is that by having an early victory, we can grow the movement. This is a victory that could, would appeal to people right across the political spectrum, and so it would allow us to to engage with people who are, you know, maybe far more politically conservative than we are, or whatever. So if that interests you, please join us or come back when you've seen what else there is. Oh okay, yeah, I just have orders to go to the district. So enjoy the room. Thank you. Um, okay, so 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 there's an example where um, in the, the so-called Rava report that was funded um, by uh, Maryland. Um, they were able to um, do, you know, basically could completely control all the election year um, without, um, and then since then, um, there have been a whole bunch of other studies. Uh, two very famous ones, one was called the California Top to Bottom Review, and every piece of election year used in California um, was shown to be, you know, shot through with, with insecurity. Um, so it's, the situation is really so bad uh, that even if you were the election official, you probably can't know whether in fact um, the election results are, are accurate, even if you're the election official. Unless, of course, you're in the situation where the result was known before the election took place, right? Where it's like the polling, you know, well, we know that in some, you know, liberal county in, you know, California, we know that, you know, Barack Obama was going to win and, you know, Certain. So, you know, it, I mean, it, if it's so obvious, then you can kind of know the result, but not because of what the machines say. 
because the reality is on the machines are so hackable that even if you are a completely honest, diligent election official, you're, you don't know that the people on your staff or someone else might have broken into the warehouse and inserted malware into the system. In more recent studies, like the so-called Ohio Everest study, they were able to show that you could virally infest. So one memory card in one voting machine, if, when it is delivering its votes back to the server, could infect the server so that in the next election, um, it, so it would, it would then provide infected memory cards so that, so that, they, that the infection could grow virally to every voting machine. Um, and so, and there, there are some procedures you could use to, to reduce the probability of that, but basically, the important top-level idea is it just shouldn't trust election gear at all. So now you say, if I can't trust election gear, and that's the gear we use to run the election, it sounds like it's hopeless. But in fact, it's just, it's not true. There's actually relatively simple ways of making elections enormously trustworthy. Um, even though the underlying gear is not trustworthy because of the ability to do audits. So the vast preponderance, well, certainly for, for jurisdictions that have bought their election equipment relatively recently, um, the preponderance use something called precinct count optical scan for in-precinct voting. And they use central count optical scan for people voting by mail. So if you can imagine the same kind of things that, at least when I took the SATs back when I was about to go to college, you fill in the ovals, um, but instead of just you know, have to send, giving it to the proctor, you often walk up to um, a, um, a machine, and you pass um, your piece of paper into this machine. So there really is an indication of my actual choice as the voter on that actual physical paper. So even if the scanner were hacked and the, the tabulator that the scanner sends the data to were, were completely subverted, um, if we go back to the original document and we do a good job with chain of custody of that original paper, we can gain confidence um, in the result of the election by just trusting the, um, the paper rather than trusting the, the, the electronic records. Does anybody have any questions about this? Is this, is this making sense? Can people give me some feedback how this lands in people? It makes sense. Uh, but are you saying that they're counting the paper too? Or that's just a reference that they need to go back? Interesting. Um, in most jurisdictions, there is no effective use of that paper to actually determine um, the real result of the election. So the, you know, the most famous state in which they do um, a, a, an audit. Um, the law says, I think, that they're supposed to hand count 2% of the precincts. Now, <clears throat> this is not a very good design from the statistical point of view, and from the security point of view, it's an even less good design. Because how do I know, as a, let's say a, an election observer from the League of Women Voters, for example, that the 2% that you are counting isn't 2% selected by the attacker? I mean, in one jurisdiction that I, uh, that I observe, um, a couple of people um, claim to have, um, uh, had to have uh, thrown dice. But since very few people are in that room, how do I know they actually threw dice at all? How do I know that they didn't you know, pick, pick particular precincts, which they knew were not under attack? I mean, if you are the attacker, you might very well concentrate your attack in a, in a few polling places, or just, the, the, just in enough to steal enough votes to change the result of the election. And you might actually go and threaten or trick people not to look at those particular polling places, right? So in order to do a really effective audit, if you want to audit a subset of the, um, of the votes, of the, of the ballots, um, we as election observers want to know that those, those ballots were picked at random, because if they're not, if they were predictable to the attacker, the attacker could concentrate their attack on on ballots that were that on uh, on precincts that weren't going to be um, reviewed. Did, did that make sense? 
So, so one, one point is we don't want to just have an audit that convinces the auditor that the election result was accurate. We would like to make design an audit that proves to anyone who's willing to attend the audit, wow, I saw that audit, and I, from personal knowledge, know um, that the election result is accurate. I'd like to think about the following situation, right? Imagine I were accused, God forbid, of a crime. But I just happened to be giving a talk on election integrity in front of a stadium full of people at that moment, right? And so someone says, well, I think Eric you know, murdered him. And said, well, at that hour, he was in front of this huge stadium giving a talk uh, on election integrity. Imagine that. Um, so, you know, hey, you can poll any of those people. Was that Eric? Was he really there? You know, so that would be an awesome position to be in. If, if on the other hand, I was you know, home with my dad, and we're pretty convinced that dad would lie to keep me out of jail, that's not as good an alibi, right? So we want a situation that's analogous to that, where if people were called in to testify, that there might have been 30, 40, 50, 70 people who attended that audit, anyone knows from personal knowledge that the election result was accurate. Now, that would be a wonderful level of transparency where essentially anyone who's willing to attend the audit would know. And then we could even have a rule that says, and by the way, you can't start the audit unless you have at least you know, a couple of representatives from each of the political parties that ran any candidates, um, at least a couple of representatives of, the, of any propositions and initiatives that are there. We want to randomly select from all the poll workers and other 30 people to make sure and pay them to be there. Let's get enough people in that room so that Essentially, it's kind of, it would be a ridiculous conspiracy. You know, I'm a person who believes in very small conspiracies. Like anything I can do myself, right? I guess it's technically not a conspiracy if you can do it all by yourself, if you in fact do it all by yourself. But like big conspiracies, uh, I, don't, I mean, I, have, I, I don't think are so likely. Small, you know, small attacks, things that can be done by one person, like write a, write a viral um, piece of malware and get it inserted in the election machine. That seems quite doable. If I have to do that, plus I have to fool a whole bunch of people that this audit that really looks very transparent wasn't really transparent, or I have to get 60 people to come to my audit, even though some are randomly selected from 700 poll workers. You know, how do you, that's a much harder thing to do. So the idea of effective auditing would be to, to create a process such that if someone were to try a purely electronic attack, that is, just do the simplest thing, insert malware that changes the, the votes, the electronic records, that that becomes essentially impractical. Because I would need to do that, plus I need to get all the people who come to the audit, including people from different political parties, people randomly selected from poll workers, or maybe randomly selected from all the county employees, or, or something like that, randomly selected from the voter rolls or whatever. If I have to, if I have to get all of those people to, to go along with my attack, that's just not likely to happen, mm. right? So that's the, that's the question. How do you design an audit? And, and even in California, where they have 30 years of experience doing audits, um, they don't do them this way. They don't do it in a way that's transparent. The way it looks, if you walk into the room, you see multiple tables. In a, in a small county like Marin, you'll see two tables of like three people. And if you're willing to stand there for an entire week watching them, you might catch them making a, what, what would look like making a mistake. Oh, they said Gore when they should have said Bush, and they said Bush when they should have said Gore. It's not transparent. First of all, you have to clone yourself to stand at multiple tables at the same time. In a place like LA, it's not two tables. It might be 30 tables. So it's, it's really effectively not transparent. If the people at that table wanted to lie and say that the, the, the polling place came up with the result it was supposed to come up with, it would be very hard on a, to, to, to actually notice that they were lying. Is that clear why that's fundamentally not very transparent? An election observer, frankly, you're just not going to stand there for a week and watch them do it. And even if you did, all you'd catch was something that looked like an error. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be obviously fraud. So that, that way of doing audits is not very good. Is it, is it clear to people any mm -hmm. questions about that? Okay. Now, in other places, make California seem awesome by comparison. Like, take Florida, for example. They have an audit law. They actually moved to precinct optical scan, just the technology you want, right, where you fill in the ovals, you pass it through the machine, the machine keeps a record that keep the 
but their audit law literally says um, they can only audit one randomly selected contest on the race. So imagine you're the attacker, right? What would you do? Um, you would um, assume that, you know, let's say you're going after the governor, you're going after the president. You'd say, hmm, 30 races, you know, 30 contests on this, uh, on this, uh, what's it called? Um, yeah, on, on the ballot, one in 30 chances you're actually going to audit my contest. Forget it. I'll just, I won't, worry, I won't worry about your audit. It's kind of the don't audit audit law, right? I mean, it's like, I mean, a random, one randomly selected contest, I mean, the, that would only be useful if you think that the, that basically the attacker is going to try to steal all the races. There's some reason why they would want to manipulate every, every contest on the ballot. Like, why would you think so? Mm -hmm. By the way, I've had Florida election officials assure me that, that, that the thing I'm suggesting, a lot of all the races, just isn't practical. And then I, of course, put them on, an, uh, on the phone with some California election officials who, you know, since the law has been in effect for 30 years, never have never run an election without doing an audit that looked at every race on, on the ballots that were selected. And they, it was kind of fun to hear the, the people who were just telling me completely impractical. And having people say, well, I actually never won an election without doing an audit, right? So it was kind of fun. Nobody, anyway, and so that was, that was interesting. People, one of the things, you'd you work with election officials, they'll tell you, you know, you just don't understand, you've never run an election. And they're right, I mean, we don't understand, but I mean, that's one reason why it's nice to have mm. election results in different states. Almost everything about, about elections is different from every state to every state. We don't, almost nothing is common. But imagine, um, an audit that was performed the following way. Um, that imagine you were you walked in and you were given a, uh, a CD or a DVD that had a complete database of every ballot in um, the uh, in this election that says I am claiming that there's a box over there labeled precinct one and the first ballot in that has these votes on it. So. It, it's really, this is not the actual way that I want to do it, but it's a good thought experiment to, to start with, okay? Um, so we say, you know, in, in precinct one, in precinct one, ballot one, right, there's uh, contest one, um, and there should be a vote for, you know, for Bush, uh, and then for contest two, there should be a vote for Smith. You know, whatever. So you can imagine having essentially what amounts to a huge spreadsheet where every ballot, we know what box it's in, what sequence in that box it is, and we know what votes the, the, the voting machine thought it saw. Now, voting machines are not perfect. You make a, a little hesitation mark, and so maybe it reads the hesitation mark as a vote, or, you know, they aren't, they aren't going to be perfect. But you can imagine having a database like this, right? Does, does, does this make sense? What it would mean. So now, imagine there was some process where we randomly, together, we randomly selected 200 ballots from, you know, we, we select from box 27, from precinct 27. We pick uh, ballot 55, right? We have some process together where all of us know that we're randomly selecting these together. So all of us know that actually we had a hand in the randomness. That no, none of us could have controlled it. In fact, even if I'm the only honest person in the room, that I still know, even if everyone else is in on it, that we're really randomly selecting those ballots. So just imagine you were confident that, that the ballots that are being looked at are, are really, truly randomly selected. Now, what would the effect of that be? So now imagine that we were hanging these 200 ballots up like laundry from a laundry line, and you were walking up with your laptop or your iPad or whatever, and you could look at what's on the DVD, and you say, okay, you know, that precinct X, ballot Y, it's supposed to have these votes on it. You could look and you could say, oh, it has the votes that I expected to have on it, right? So now, as you're going from looking at the first ballot to looking at the 200th ballot, your level of kind of confidence that, well, yeah, the database I'm looking at seems to be accurate, right, would be going up. Well, statistically, likewise, when you get to the 200th ballot, unless the races are crazy close, or people have done a really bad job marking up the ballot, so there's a lot of these hesitation marks, and, you know, but you would be able to get to extremely high levels of confidence after only looking at 200 ballots. 
The funny thing is, it really doesn't matter how big the election is, that the same trick will work on, for small counties and even extremely large counties. Can anybody figure out, like, does anybody have an idea why the same 200 ballots would work across, uh, independent of the number of uh, ballot, of the number of total ballots? As you can see them and um, seeing is believing. Excuse me? Seeing is believing. It's not an emotional thing, it's a, it's a mathematical thing, but the analogy well, I that, meant, that, that I, I, I meant that. Uh, here's the thing. So imagine I've got this consomme, right? Uh, and I'm asking you the question, oh, we've actually got food people here, actually. Um, where um, I've stirred it around really well, and now the question is, is the soup too salty for her? Right? Well, how many spoonfuls of soup do I need to taste before I would know whether the soup is too salty if I've stirred it? 100. Yeah. Does it, does it matter whether I have a small pot of soup or a big pot of soup? If no. it's well mixed, one spoonful will tell me that was too salty. Yeah. True. Right? So in the same way, if I randomly select, essentially the molecules, right? I've, by stirring it, what I'm saying is I really randomly select the molecules from the entire pot. That's what stirring it does, right? So by randomly selecting, instead of what they normally do, we normally um, recount entire precincts. So if you recount entire precincts, you have to look at thousands and thousands of ballots. Because really, I'm only getting one data point for the entire precinct. You know, was that precinct accurate? I'm not really getting much additional confidence. But frankly, by doing this sharpshooter style where I'm randomly selecting individual ballots, where the batch is an individual ballot, um, you're able to um, get to very high levels of confidence very quickly, in the same way because of the salt in the soup analogy. Mm -hmm. So th does that kind of make sense to people? Why would you only take one note? I, out of thousands of ballots, you would be satisfied with picking one? 200. Then? Oh, you pick 200? Yeah, I mean, no. the, the, the way it works is unless the races are very, very close, no. you know, between 80, 180 to 220, you know, in that range, you start to get to this 95% confidence, mm -hmm. or 96, 97% confidence. Now, in this kind of audit, the idea of doing a risk-limiting audit is you pick a risk level in advance. You say, we want to be 96% confident. And then you go to your statistician and you say, how many ballots will you need to look at? And they'll say, well, the closest race was this, right? So unless they're very unclearly marked up, we should be able to do it with 194 ballots. So let's go for 200, right? And then you can check at the end, what level of confidence did we get to? And you can keep checking. Now, if you get to these really wacky races where there's just like three, you know, three ballots or something like that, then you have basically no choice. You have to do a hand count to get to the 95 or 100% confidence. <clears throat> the, but, but typically that's what happens in contested, very close elections anyway. People, people get recounted anyway. So it's not a real change to the election procedure. The, the change is <clears throat> we want in every contest to have some reason for believing that a hacked machine didn't, didn't change the result of the election. And so that's why this kind of doing it by sampling and having a ritual um, that's very, very transparent, very public, um, it would be would be a good idea. Would 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 get us to that level of confidence. Now there's this additional trick that we play called SOBA, and I, I can go into it if people want to know about it, or I can just point you at the literature that we wrote about it, where if you don't actually want to publish every ballot and exactly how, what the votes are on that ballot, or publish pictures of the ballots. There's a way to do this kind of auditing without actually publishing that data. Does anyone know why you might not want to publish um, this, this, this kind of data, this kind of exactly what is on each ballot? Does anybody have an idea? I think there's two really good reasons not to, not to actually publish that kind of data. Um, one is around vote buying and intimidation. So say someone wants me to vote, let's say I'm a county employee, and someone wants me to vote for um, him for county supervisor. And he says to me, Eric, if you want to keep your job, um, here's what you need to do. I want you to vote for this weird you know, set of judges 
right? I want you to vote for the first Republican and the second Democrat and the third Republican and the fourth Democrat. He gives me some weird, you know, sequence, right? And that's kind of like signing, like I'm kind of signing the ballot by, 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 by selecting this kind of weird, and he says, I'm going to search that database. It's going to be public information. Oh, I'm going to go to the audit. I'm going to get that DVD. I'm going to look for a ballot that has that exact sequence, right? And if there isn't one, you're out of a job. Right? And it, it has to have that sequence, and it has to be voting for me for county supervisor. So it facilitates vote buying and intimidation, which makes it a problem for me. The other problem I have with actually publishing this data is it just reduces privacy. Right? So let's say you know that um, I'm going to be writing myself in for county supervisor, because I always write myself in for county supervisor. Right? Now you can fix this, I'm the only one who does that. Um, you, you can see how I voted on everything else. Right? So it's not a great system. So there's a way to actually do this kind of auditing um, where you commit the relationship between the vote and the ballot ID. You commit to it, but you don't reveal it unless that ballot is randomly selected. So that's a kind of clever trick that when I worked out with um, a statistician from Berkeley and a brilliant cryptographer from Microsoft and a few other um, real smart people. Um, and that's the, the SOBA auditing trick that allows you to get the same level of confidence um, without actually having to um, publish more data than you'd really like to publish. So now, why is this all relevant um, to, um, to Occupy? Anybody? It's a catalyst for bigger change. Uh, yes, the advocate for recording didn't get that. It's a catalyst for bigger change. Yes, there's an old organizer maxim um, that I learned from an organizer in San Francisco named Buck Baggett that, um, that he was in a really difficult campaign um, where he was finding it difficult to get people energized. And then he was looking at some acorn manual. This is when acorn existed. Some old acorn manual. Um, and it said something about have early, you know, quick wins, even if they seem small and easy, do it anyway. And he was like, wow, well, actually, there's already funding for a healthcare clinic um, in that neighborhood. I can probably get a whole bunch of people to go into the county supervisor and demand that we have a healthcare clinic in our neighborhood, right? And they're going to win because actually the money's already allocated, but it was closed down because people were worried about neighbors and a NIMBY or whatever or something. So he went in and did this kind of theatrical thing, and they won right there on the spot. After that, he had very little problem um, with the energy of the group. So if you can have victories, even if it, it, they seem kind of like a little theatrical in their nature, this would not be theatrical. Leave it to people like me who work without Occupy, working in election integrity. We may never win this victory. We just don't have the level of power um, that something like Occupy does. I don't think anyone does. But, <laughs> I, but I don't think that's true, because well, actually this kind of procedural change is, like in, in uh, I was talking to the, to the election official who, who heads um, Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. He would love to make this change. If he had just a little bit of push from anyone, he would probably institute, you know, I should, we should talk about Occupy, we should talk to Occupy Portland about this, because he totally wants to do this. And if he just had some energy behind him, he could probably go get money from the state to actually do this wouldn't actually cost them all that much dough to actually do this. 100,000 bucks, 50,000 bucks, 100,000 bucks, not a lot. So this is an area where, depending upon state law, I mean, in Florida, it would require a change um, to state law because they have that, that weird, you can only audit one race, one contest on the entire ballot. But most states, um, well, don't have a, well, huh, it's interesting, which states would actually require a change in law? That's, that's something I, I can find out. But, I think here in New York, we could have you know, kind of a meditate in or a, you know, a pray in in front of the Board of Elections office. You know, we can decide on Monday it's one person, on Tuesday it's two people, on Thursday it's three, four, it's four people, and the next day it's 16 people. Just keep having it grow and grow. We could do something where, um, if, where eventually they would just have to, uh, have to cave in. Um, we have the ability to garner national attention, on what we're asking for is so easy to document how valuable it is. I mean, it'd be very easy to get a whole list of academics from, with you know, university credentials at Yale and Harvard and MIT. Say, yeah, actually, this is the this is a good way to do 
to, um, to remove the possibility of any purely electronic attacks. So that's the question I wanted to kind of throw out to you folks, on, or questions like that. If, in fact, it's possible to use the energy um, of Occupy, the visibility of Occupy, to have a victory in this area of going from having what are amount to completely untrustworthy elections, where you know, having elections where you can tell, okay, so that doesn't it doesn't stop people from doing a lot of tricky things like redistricting and stuff like that, but at least you know when people cast votes, they were captured on and on and they were accurately counted. Just to get that part of the election, and we could, I believe we could win this um, in many states by November of, of 2012. You're wondering how we'd organize it with, with an occupy? Well, I mean, that's really a great question. What are your thoughts about how you would, how you would want to, um, how you would want to organize this? Um, Is that a question people would like to talk about? Because like, I, I already, have, I mean, I'm, I've been very involved and I have a lot of ideas already how you could do that. I yes, Matt, go ahead. Okay. Um, well, uh, hold a book. I probably have to hold several teachings on it. Um, just because, the, I mean, the first few of them, people, not everyone might go to it. But the more often you hold a teaching, the more people are going to come to it. And, like, obviously people care about border fraud, border election. I mean, that's right in, right in tune with us. So, a few, hold a few teachings on it. And, um, go to the have people video them and have media do it, have media video that and have live streaming of it. Um, design group, I'm in that. We make some flyers for it. Press release group for it. The, the working groups are all there, you just gotta utilize them. And probably use direct action to have people sit out there. <laughs> Pardon me? Probably use direct action group to have people sit out, outside the elections. The squatting. Does that work? I'm loving it. But <laughs> what are, who, 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 who likes it? Yeah, that's great. Any other ideas? There's the solution cluster. Hmm. What, what, would, what does the solution cluster do, and what would we want them to do? Oh, this is on Sundays. They meet at 60 Wall Street, where they talk about. I've never attended one. I've just heard and received emails. But it sounds like something that would be really appropriate to bring to that meeting to see how it could be put in. Um, there is an actual group that's dedicated to um it's th they're um they're not doing the from what i understand from the name of the group it's more of um a restructuring of how the how all elections are taking place in the first place however i'm sure they'd be open to something that's in the meantime and working forward if you can make a good case for it and i think you can um Politics and electoral reform. Electoral right, work reform. with, um, um, also work yeah, with politics. Right? Mm -hmm. What do people think of this idea of working with the, the like, like um, religiously affiliated, like clergy and people? I, mean, I, I like the idea of like, like prayings and meditators where it's like quiet and respectful, but it just doesn't go away. <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> we're like poorly to meditate in front of your election office, or right in your election office, um, you know, as long as it takes for, you know, we're envisioning a trustworthy election, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's great. We're, we, that's like tremendous moral force. I even take like a, a little, you know, bling, mm -hmm. you know, candles, everything. <laughs> like, do it up, right? Like, I think direct action should help plan it, but I think we should potentially populate it with, like, meditators and, oh, like... That's great. It has, I think, tremendous moral force. It's like, huh, we're, we're, we think, you know, here, here's an MIT professor who's saying that this is, like, the right way to do it. It seems right to us. What you're doing now, we're under the impression, is completely untrustworthy. Mm -hmm. Multiple studies have shown it. And we're here until you fix it, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think this, I'm not sure if it would pertain to this one exactly, but there's also one called Political Action Impact Group, which actually is tr going to try and get legislation passed, will promote certain legislation. Which I'm not sure if that's what this is, but Political Action Impact. Political Action Impact. I'm not sure if that's the same thing as what you're talking about, but it's it's similar, so it might be. That's all, I think that's all I have for now. Other, other ideas for how to get this done? 
backboard, I mean, how do people feel about, about you know, how do people feel about the general idea that early wins um, will add energy to the movement, and especially early wins that have this kind of like, they're likely to appeal to people right across the political spectrum, I mean, making election results trustworthy, right? Mm -hmm. um, it kind of gives us, uh, I mean, I think we're way scarier to people if we are building bridges across, you know, big divides on mm -hmm. um, right to the, you know, the total Tea Party, whatever. Um, so, so having early victories that have that, that attribute, I think that that's cool. powerful. Um, probably couldn't hurt either to start your own working group on it. Maybe have, have potentially have its own working group? Now, what do, what do you think about the kind of early victories working group? A, a working group mm -hmm. that's focused yeah. on, we'll, we're willing to, we'll, we'll take this one on first, but the mm -hmm. idea of like, we think that the, the best form, a very useful form of outreach is early victories. So like, mm -hmm. it's not, yeah. it's, an, it's an early victories working group. If it just found it an early victories working group. <laughs> <laughs> Something that has that theme. Word. Word. That's okay, so uh, how much more time do we have in this particular? Because we can figure out if we want to switch to a different topic. It's 2.13 now, and this mm. um, this session is going up to 2.30, is it? Is it 2.30? Uh, does anybody know when this uh, 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 Actually, mm, yeah, it's 2.30. <laughs> okay, so we have um, a little bit more than 15 minutes. Do people want to keep brainstorming about this, or? On, we can talk about something else. Mm -hmm. um, more stuff. Pardon? More stuff. Pardon? More stuff. More, more stuff. stuff. Yeah. Other, other, is that uh, more means other? Yeah. Okay, well, <coughs> I'll talk about this <coughs> other thing I'm, I'm working on and see if, uh, or someone else can take over the floor. I mean, I, I, wanted, I mentioned to some of you folks that I'm working on this question of a workshop designed to reinvent the notion occupy. So it doesn't necessarily require always camping. Mm -hmm. It could invent, but it could be um, something that involves culture um, instead of uh, always having to actually camp. So one of the questions that's really exciting to me is, you know, how do you do something that has enough duration mm -hmm. so that literally I'd love people to know that if they show up any time, any day between noon and seven, Unless the weather is just you know ridiculous, right? They will experience something weird, fun, historic, political, interesting, maybe child friendly, so that it's just like oh you can't you know you always know there's something fun to do. Mm -hmm. So at, at at the park. So I'm thinking about one thing. One of the questions that I'd love to think with you folks about, if you're moved by that idea that we want to be inspiring and powerful in that park. I think one of the big challenges is duration, right? Recently, a bunch of performing artists did this 24-hour Broadway, you know, Occupy mm -hmm. Broadway yeah. thing. And, oh my god, that was wonderful, but really difficult, right? To have, you know, to have basically a single stage where you have really quality artists do 24 hours worth of material. Mm -hmm. I mean, they really had to organize their back shots off of that. But what's easier to do than that? Right? If we want to have long duration every day, seven hours a day, we're doing cool stuff in the park. Can we do things that have long duration, which are kind of easier than, than having a stand-up comic for an hour and then a singing group for an hour, and then, which I think is hard to do. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering about like how do you do long duration? One, one of the ideas that I wanted to throw out to people are games. You could easily imagine people putting together a series of, you know, so anti-imperialism baseball, right? Where instead of hitting a ball, I get a question like, what government did the United States overthrow in 1964, right? Like, oh, right. And if, and, and if you know what dictator we put in place, you get a double, right? I mean, you can imagine things where the games, right, are, can go on for a long period of time. It can be funny and I mean, if they're cleverly designed, right? Um, so that, that idea of that you, you could use things like games, right, that would be, and it, it could be really political. Now, I haven't thought about... Um, let me say, if you actually do that game, some people might take a lot of offense to that. I mean, it might be true, but some people might not want to accept it. Let's right, right, and, <laughs> and totally. And the question of 
and that's what I'm, I'm planning a workshop, and I, I think I got your name. If not, I Matt. don't get it. Yeah. Um, but the idea is let's get really clear on what needs we're trying to meet. We want to be inspired. We want to be funny. We want to be. We want to have a good sure. time, right? No, we want to build community. And then we should only do things that meet those needs. Mm -hmm. And if one of the things we're thinking is that, that anti-imperialism baseball um, with questions like that are going to offend people we'd really like to bring into the movement, that's an awesome reason to do maybe environmental def defense baseball instead. I mean, I don't, I mean I'm not saying, True. I mean, yes, I'm, I'm not married to any particular strategies, mm -hmm. but I think it's fun to get your juices flowing if you believe that occupation, whatever it means, it needs to be something that takes place over a long duration. Right? Mm -hmm. and you can't do anything in five minutes to say, okay, we've, we've met the need for occupying. You know, it, has to, it has to be there at least for many oh. hours, many days. You know, what do you do that has long duration? So one, one thought that occurs to me that I wanted to throw out is if, if you've ever gone to like a Renaissance fair or something like that, mm -hmm. those things can go on for a long time, right? Why? Well, because a puppeteer shows up and he's on puppet stage too. And, he or she does, you know, some puppet things for a few hours, and then they leave, and a storyteller shows up and takes over that. So it's kind of much more like a relay thing, where you could have like three stages, and and you know, and where people are coming and going, and they're scheduled, and um, oh, learn to dance this the, the, this dance with us, and you know, build help to build a puppet that does X, right? So you could have multiple areas, and every time you go, it's different, you know, than the last time you went. So it's something that has this kind of fair quality, but instead of the fair having the Renaissance theme, it would have a theme that's coherent with the kind of lesson that mm -hmm. we're trying to teach, the lesson we were you know. But so I'm really interested in this question of duration. What do you do that, that's like, builds community, inspires people, meets other needs that you have, and that potentially can go on for lots of hours without it being something that's a drag for us to actually need to do for a lot of time. Like serving food is an example of something that takes up a chunk of time. People enjoy it. People enjoy feeding one another. People enjoy eating. So, so feeding people, we did it on Thanksgiving. It was fabulous, right? So there's an example of something. Uh, so there's food. There's games. There's this notion of multiple stages. Um, with, with artists coming and going. Um, other ways that we can do things that, that occupy for long periods of time. What do, do ideas come up with that? Without sleeping there. What? Without sleeping there, right? Assuming that we don't get this well, we don't get the sleeping bag. We're not going to sleep anywhere anymore. Pardon me? We're not going to be able to sleep anywhere anymore. Right. Yeah. I mean, let's assume that for the sake of this brainstorming session, let's assume that that's true. We're not going to get. Uh, Mm. So, what else can you do over the long term to increase awareness of this? Wait, what about rituals? Mm. Right? What kind of rituals? Rituals can take place over a long time. Like, for example, I, I had this idea of a funeral for the middle class. <laughs> I was thinking we're going to have real clergy, right? And we can, we can show the graphs. And there's some awesome graphs about what happened during the Reagan administration where the, they, they changed the tax laws in the middle class. It has this big belly, this, this graph, and mm -hmm. the middle class shrunk. And they, they, lots of people went down, and a few people went up. Um, so that kind of like funeral for the middle class, that's something uh, that could take place over, over a period of time. I mean, we could even go to thrift stores and get people, you know, mm -hmm. um, all dressed up in ties and suits and, you know, and, and do this, do something. Which I think actually would be kind of cool to get some of our people a little better things to wear. Because <laughs> we look cooler in pictures if they don't look like they're camping. Uh, thanks, for, thanks for saying. Um, so, so rituals. Anyone else? Anything else on um, that that, uh, that 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 would counter to this ritual category? Anything that would count as a ritual that you think would be kind of a fun thing to carry out? Is anything well, besides the, the funeral? Well, for the holiday season, you can sing. 
all the Christmas songs. It's right, so holiday, 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 holiday rituals. Mm -hmm. One thought I had would be, we ought to, like, right now it's weird to me, but we don't have any ticker tape parades for the people coming back from Iraq. Oh, wow. So we could, I mean, it's kind of a wonderful cultural vacuum, right, that, that active duty and veteran military doing, like, the New Year's Eve party for the vets, right? But not, when I, mean, I say vet, I don't mean that they're not necessarily active duty. I mean, they could be, just you know, way, just a way to respect them. appreciating their sacrifices on and talking about that they're going to be facing a lot more sacrifices because they're they're, they're going to come back to a country where the job picture sucks yeah. and, and lots of other things. So it's not exactly the conventional ticker tape parade, right? But something that that uh, that honors them. It seems like this is like gorgeous because the the country is just like okay, the war ended, you know, yawn, whatever. No big expressions of gratitude for people who gave just ridiculous amounts. A million people served in Iraq, right? Um, so something that focuses on what a bad idea this was, but we're really grateful for your sacrifice. You know, or, I don't know. But something about that, that's something that could take place over it. You know, we could do, that could be the theme for New Year's Eve and New Year's Day, right? Um, something like that. I'll bring that direct action right away. The latter? The next direct action meeting, I'll mention it, mention it to him immediately. I'm not sure who else to bring it to, but it definitely seems like... So it. work with direct action on that? Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I mean, they usually handle the marches and other actions, and what happened yesterday. But I can't think of who else to go to with regards to this. Because I think we should have some sort of march of appreciation for them. No? Well, I mean, I think that... Yeah, so one thing we could do is... Um, if you're willing to help me with this, um, we could, you know, in a place like this, we can just, you know, collect people's email addresses and stuff and try to create a group of people, and then we could do it with direct action. But I think also we need to contact veteran organizations and stuff. There's, uh, there's Iraq Veterans Against the War. There's a bunch of groups. We got to pull them in early to see, well, what do you want this to look like? What do you, uh, how, what do you want said at something mm -hmm. like this? Because well, I look at it as something that ought to be Occupy Wall Street reaches out. Um, to express appreciation for the vets. I mean, that's, I think, a nice way to express it in the media. In fact, I think we ought to have them basically plan it for us. <laughs> because they'll know what images are powerful. And, you know, uh -huh. I mean, so, yeah, so, but I mean, I don't, I mean, I, I think that, uh, that having a New Year's party, uh, a New Year's party for the vets right in our park would be a cool. But I think, yeah, working with Frank Action sounds like a cool thing to do. Um, I, will, I think there is going to be a party already in uh, in Zuccotti on New Year's. So I'd say, I mean, the people are already going to be there. Right. So just a matter of saying, of making an announcement or just having some sort of thing of awareness for the troops, and people will see it. Well, and direct action is awesomely po popular around here, right? So yes. direct action voted that, yeah, we want the theme to be something oh, about, sure. about vets and active duty military on, and, you know, if the reaction votes it, then I think the GA and everybody else will, will like it too. Uh -huh. So I think you're exactly right that it going to direct action. I mean, that, that resonates for me. Also. Really? Yeah, that sounds good. Cool. 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 Um, so, what are the, in terms of this occupying on. Do you have any other ideas about, about what, what occupy should mean on that? Uh, first of all, what, what needs would you like? A, a new meaning of occupy to me. I mean, how, who, who thinks it really needs to be kind of inspiring? That we have a responsibility, or possibly maybe not the word I want to use, but we have an opportunity to continue to inspire growth in the movement nationwide and across the world. And if the park kind of often looks empty and boring and yeah. you know, sterile, that's kind of not as good. Um, as having it look active and fun and powerful and funny and that we're in charge of it, it's our park, right? But that kind of, the ownership of the park provides a, a lever to inspire people to do cool things around the world. That is where we're, we're at the sound right. So inspiration is a powerful need. With regards to the park, you have to remember we can't put tents there, so it's kind of hard to keep warm, which is why it's kind of empty right now. Right, but you, if you can imagine, you know, games, things that keep true, people true. capable, kind of Running moving, around. right? True. 
on to that. Yeah, I think that, that's right. It's actually a list of challenges, right? There's the challenge. I think can figure out how to send that up. Um, so yeah, so challenges that we face. So there's there's just durations. There's weather. <laughs> Just a lot of hours to fill up, mm -hmm. right? So that's kind of a duration problem. There's like cold and wet, I mean, those kinds of challenges. What other challenges can we face on in trying to give that part of the feeling of being occupied? The new rules? Put in place. <laughs> right, right. The, uh, the, the, the rules. Although, I wouldn't be at all surprised if in the end some of them turn out to like. Be our, to our advantage. Like, if we get to like peak and record when they when they throw away our books, if they you know we get oh gee you know freedom of speech here there's, there's that First Amendment thing. Right? Uh -huh. I mean there may be ways to get to like, you know I mean, we're the mic check people right we're the people yeah. who they take away microphones and we do something way more powerful uh -huh. on, than the microphone. So that's why I want to have lawyers in on the team who can say oh my God what a great test case yeah do that. Try to get them to throw away your books. You know, try to get them to like stop you from painting. You know, on uh, signs in the park, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah. So those those two seem to be key challenges: duration, weather, and the rules that they put in place. But what what needs are we trying to meet? I mean, we all agreed. I think inspiring. We want we want whatever we do um, to be inspirational. Right? Do people care about? Community that we want people to feel that they're part of something, right? Mm -hmm. So that that would be neat. What about this kind of ease of kind of inclusivity, right? That someone has, you know, they're not very good at talking in front of crowds. Maybe they got an anxiety or they're not, but they're good at painting. They're good at making a sign. They're good. At, that almost no matter what you're good at, there's something for you to do, and and that's clearly relevant. It's not like make work. That there's a very wide range of roles that, that actually make sense. So that kind of inclusivity is a, is a need when people, mm -hmm. when people feel that's, that's a powerful thing. You know, analog hand raise. Um, analog. Um, <laughs> so what are their needs? Would people like a, a new, different like, Where are we in terms of time? Oh, we're done. Um, <laughs> no, it's it's 2.30, so we can, we can wind up on our... Before you close it, one more thing to um, how you can do the, the original topic. Um, they're coming up, with, right now we have nycga.net. They're coming up with another one called occupywallstreet.net, occupywallstreet.net, which is like, nycga is for people within the group who already know what's going on. Occupywallstreet.net is for people who are trying to find out what's going on with it. And the this is a- facing website. Yeah, th that website, having something on there about this would be really cool, because it, it's, because like everyone knows exactly what that is. Right, so there's this, there's yeah. a challenge of kind of outrage. Oh yeah. Right, so once we start doing this, mm -hmm. how do we make sure that every concierge in the city knows, oh yeah, you gotta tell people, yeah, even if yeah. they have kids, that they have to go see, you know, you have to go see the revolution. You know? mm. It's like going on right now. You gotta go. Um, you have to watch it on TV. Go and see it um, So yeah. So do any, anything else people want to say about this? Let's Write it down. Pardon me. Make sure you don't lose anything you just wrote down. Oh, you're gonna walk Don't worry. I've got my camera right here. Cool. I'll write it all down. Um, okay. Well, thanks for coming to this workshop. I appreciate it.